The Cavalcade of America presented by DuPont. presentations of the Cavalcade of America brought to you by DuPont have featured the contributions made to our national life and ideals by farmers, railroad builders, sailors, school teachers, physicians, explorers, and many others. All have played their parts with steadfast faith and quiet courage. Not so well known to most of our listeners is the work done by people in America's chemical industry in carrying forward the discoveries of research chemistry and turning them into useful products. Some of these chemical products come to you identified by the DuPont Oval trademark. Many are produced by DuPont for use by other manufacturers, who in turn create countless items of comfort and convenience for you. 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 Which are physical expression of the phrase, better say, chemistry. DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra plays as an overture two compositions of Victor Herbert, Yester Soft, and Punchinello.
the onward march of the cavalcade of America are the inventive pioneers who looked into the future and began the vision that men could go down to the sea in steamships. It began on the Quaker farm of Joseph Longstreet in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. There in the spring of 1785, Joseph's son Joshua finds a neighbor named John Fitch busy on the banks of a stream. Yes, Joshua? What is it? I've been looking everywhere for them. Father wants to know, can he help him with the plowing? Well, tell him I'm busy with other matters. Very well. But, but, but John, what has he got there? Boat? It's a very strange-looking boat. It's only two feet long. It's a model, Joshua. I don't think I ever saw anything quite like it before. Mm, nor I, Joshua. Nor anyone else. You know... It looks something like an Indian war canoe. Yes. I got the idea from that. Two rows of paddles, six on each side. Oh, they won't work. No man could move all those twelve paddles. No man is supposed to move them. Then what makes them paddle? This bar here. Fastened to the paddles and connected with its driving rod. And that disappears into a box. What is in the little box, John? Magic? <laughs> No, Joshua. Steam. When there's plenty of steam, you blow this little whistle. That's called a safety valve. Then what happens? Then I let some of the steam into the box and... Oh, John! John, (laughs) run! Don't be frightened. It's perfectly safe. See and see it's trial fit. Help me put it in the water. Yes, John. Yeah. It's heavy. Yes, it's heavy laden. Months of work and... All my hopes are in it. There. There we are. Well, it, it floats all right. Too bad there are no sails or anything to make it go. Oh, it shouldn't need sails. Or even a wind, Joshua. Just the steam. Now, when I throw this lever, it should start to work. There. See? Paddles begin to move. Through the side boat. Oh, John! John, look! Gold? Yes, Joshua, yes. John, what does he call this wonder? Why, I haven't thought of any special name for it. It's just a, a steamboat. John Fitch patented his invention and secured from the states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, and Virginia the exclusive privilege to build and operate steamboats on all their waterways for 14 years. He raised enough money in Philadelphia to build a steamboat 45 feet long with the assistance of Henry Voigt, a watchmaker. At last, on August 22nd, 1787, the boat is ready to be launched into the Delaware River. Great crowds are on the bank to lead his wonder. John Morris, one of the syndicates that raised money for the experiment, stands anxiously with John Fitch near the waves. Are you quite sure, Mr. Fitch, that when your boat hits the water, she'll not break in two? Mr. Morris, nothing on earth is certain. And on the water, it's even more uncertain. Well, your invention has cost a lot of money. If your toy should fail to work... It's not a toy, Mr. Morris. Even though it's only the fourth steam engine in America, so many distinguished John! persons do not gather to watch toys. Oh, friend John! Friend John! Why, Joshua! <laughs> What are you doing in town here? Father drove me in to see thy real boat on the Delaware. I hope you don't see it go to the bottom of it. Oh, how can we say such a thing? Well, most of this crowd here thinks it more than likely. But they didn't see we launched by model. This big boat looks the very image of it. It is, exactly. Then it must float, too. But it's heavier. And it's bigger, so it'll float even better. Oh, you give me courage, Joshua. John, who are all those men over there? And why is a special place been set aside for them? Are they builders of boats, too? No. Uh, well, in a way, they are. But they're building a ship much greater than mine, Joshua. Another steamboat? No. It has mightier power than steam. They're building our ship of state. Those men are members of the new Constitutional Convention. Everything's ready, John. The tide is right. Huh? Her voice. Is steam up? I've got four pressure ready. All right. Great launcher. Final board, John. Well, John, 
I'll go back to my father. All right, Joshua. Wish me well. Good voyage, John. Thank you. Hey, give me a hand, boy. There you are. Come aboard. Thanks. Hey, you men back there. Cut away the poles. All right, man. Knock those shots out. Yeah. When she's afloat, boy, I'll give you a signal. Then give her the scene. Very good, John. She's moving, John. Hey, Sam, sail away, sir. Cast off the tow line. But we may need the tow line to get ashore. Cast it off. This is no canal boat. We'll sink or swim, but we won't be towed. We'll never hit the water. Oh, the Lord be with us, boy. She's both, John. Sure he does. Oh, how well she rides. Hey, give her steam, boy. Give her steam. I'll take the helm. All right. Wide. The paddles are turning. Is everything all right, John? I don't know, Mark. I don't know. Yes. Look. She's making headway against the tide. Good. Listen to the people cheer. Well, we've made a good start. Uh, I wonder where we'll end. Why, we'll finish at Burlington, 20 miles upstream. No, boy. I think the steamboat has started a voyage that won't be finished for centuries. successful was his 45-foot steamboat that in 1788 Fitch built a 60-footer that carried 30 passengers. And two years later, a larger boat with a stern paddle wheel ran the 20 miles upstream to Burlington in three hours and ten minutes in regular service. But the cost of operating the lines was very high, and the mechanics of steam engines were not well known then. Besides, competition from stagecoaches was greater along the Delaware than any other river. The outlook was unprofitable. Within a few years, the steamboat of John Fitch was but a memory. A new name loomed on the horizon, Robert Fulton. Although Fulton did not launch his first boat till after Fitch had died, he had been interested in canals and inland navigation. His work takes him to Paris, where in 1802, Robert Livingston, the American minister to France, hears what he has accomplished and sends for him. You uh, sent for me, Mr. Livingston? Yes, Mr. Fulton. Since you built your diving boat for Napoleon, I've been thinking about your work. Oh, you you heard of the Nautilus? Well, I'm afraid it was more curious than useful. Well, still, I'm told it stayed submerged for four hours. Four hours and a half, to be exact. Uh, not that it mattered. The British fleet refused to come our way, and we had to bring my fine torpedoes back on you. I see. Well, would you like to use your inventive powers for purposes of daily use? Oh, I'd greatly prefer it. You know, when I was a boy of ten, I made my own pencils out of sheet lead so that I could draw. I've heard you're a good draftsman. But my interest in mechanics has a less uh, praiseworthy origin, which is laziness. <laughs> For years, when I lived near Lancaster, uh, I'm a Pennsylvanian, you see, I used to like to go fishing on the Conestoga Creek. But I hated to row a boat. So I fastened a pair of paddle wheels connected with an offset bar, which I could turn by hand with a gentle swaying of the body. Very pleasant. Have you ever thought of turning those paddle wheels with anything but muscle? Or what else? Oh, I see. You mean think? Exactly. Well, I have no funds, and such toys cost money. I have the money. And something more. I'm interested in developing the steamboat in America. Uh You see, I have the franchise for steamboat navigation in the state of New York. Well, there are plenty of bad roads and good water there to make steamboat transportation desirable. And you're practical enough to make it profitable. Thank you. Unfortunately, New York's a long way off. Do you object to going back? Well, my prospects at present seem quite excellent with Napoleon. I'm not sure I want to return to America at this time. Oh, Uncle Robert. I... Uncle Robert. I... Oh, I... I'm sorry. Am I interrupting? Come in, my dear. Uh, this is Mr. Fulton, my niece, Miss Harriet Livingston. How do you do? Mr. Robert Fulton, who invented the diving boat? Your servant, ma'am. I've just been trying to persuade Mr. Fulton to go back to America and build a steamboat for me. And you refused, Mr. Fulton? I hesitated, Miss Livingston. I appreciate your uncle's offer, but... Well, I want you to think it over before you make a final decision, Mr. Fulton. I'm sailing in a week's time. And I'd be very happy to know that you were going to be on the same packet with my niece and myself. Oh, may I add a word to my uncle's plea, Mr. Fulton? 
It doesn't seem right that America's talented men should give their inventions to any but their own country. Can't I appeal to your patriotism? Well, I... I only hesitate, Miss Livingston, because so far, France has offered more opportunities for my work. I am offering you a chance not only to make a name for yourself, but to be of some service to your country. Arrive at Brown Shipyards in Greenwich Village to meet Fulton for the trial trip. Well, there she is, Harriet. Ready hitting. It's wonderful, Robert. To think that you made it all yourself. Oh, hardly myself, my dear. The engine was designed by Joel Barlow. It was built in England by Bolton and Watts. And the boat itself was built by Charles Brown. But it was your idea. Well, it was your uncle's idea, really. Oh. And if it hadn't been for your persuasive powers, I'd probably still be in France trying to build diving boats. Oh, it's certainly a lovely ship, Robert. How long is it? 133 feet and oh. 7 feet deep. Oh, I didn't notice it first. It's the name painted on the side there. Uh-huh. You've named it Claremont after Uncle Robert's place on the Hudson. Claremont is your home, too, you know. And uh, who is supposed to be complimented the more? Uncle Robert or me? Mm-hmm. I resisted the temptation to name her Harriet because, well, if she turned out to be a failure. The success of this venture means a lot to you, doesn't it, Robert? More than I can say, Harriet. If I succeed, I'll no longer be a penniless inventor. I'll be able to ask your father for permission to announce our engagement. I gave you that permission long ago. Oh, I know, dear, but... Well, Robert... Oh, oh here comes... Well, Don't go now. Everything in readiness for the trial? Oh, yes, Mr. Livingston. The scene has been up for some time. Uh, shall we walk over to the dock and go aboard? Robert, are you sure it won't explode? <laughs> Don't be frightened. Mr. Fulton can swim. Oh, oh. oh, I'm sure it's safe, Harriet. What provision have you made against fire? Well, I hope to keep it entirely confined to the boilers. <laughs> Out there under that housing is a 20-foot boiler set in bricks. The engine is forward. Will steam really turn those paddle wheels? Why, they look enormous. They're over 15 feet across. How fast will it go? I don't know, but we'll soon see. Oh. The crowd on the dock seems interested. Yes, yes, hoping to see a catastrophe, undoubtedly. Oh, yeah. Will you let us pass, please? We want to get aboard. Go ahead. I'm sure I wouldn't take a chance. So, Fulton's folly is about to start, huh? <laughs> I hope so, my friend. I bet she blows up before she gets out in the river. Well, I'm not afraid. I'm going aboard. Well, you better take Bill along with you, mister. Come, Robert. Come, Harriet. Yes, I will. Look at him, crazy fool. Anyone knows you can't drive a boat by steam? Well, sure. Say, them notables aboard don't look any too happy. I'm waiting to see them all get a wetting in the river. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty, huh? Well, you'll soon know. Yeah, casting off. Say, where's he planning to go? Albany, he says. Oh, (laughs) tides against her and winds against her, and she'll never make it. What? She'll blow up in a minute. Hey, huh? to Albany and returned in 62 hours running time, averaging nearly five miles per hour. The only other ways of travel up the Hudson then were by very bad roads or by sailboat, often against wind and tide. So the comfortable, reliable Claremont was a commercial success. Cavalcade of America presented by DuPont moves on. More steamboats are built, but all of them depended on wood for fuel under their boilers. One of these is operated by Captain Daniel Peck. One day, Peck has as his passenger a delightful old gentleman, the Reverend Eliphalet Knopf, president of Union College, who cheerfully comes to the wharf at Albany. Well, Captain, nice day. 
I'm looking forward to a delightful trip down the Hudson. Yes, barring accident. Well, that, Captain, is, as always, in the hands of Providence. Uh, shall I go aboard? Uh, if you don't mind a piece of advice, Doctor, take a seat in the barge we're towing. Oh, why the barge? Why not here on the steamboat? Well, uh, sir, you'll find the barge more comfortable. And cheaper, too? No, sir. To be honest with you, sir, places in a barge cost more. Well, then I have two good reasons for riding on the steamboat. First, it is cheaper. And second, I want to see how the engine works. Well, yeah, suit yourself, sir. But don't say I didn't advise you different. <laughs> but I, I can't understand why it's cheaper to ride on the boat instead of the barge. <laughs> you don't have to understand it. All you have to do is believe it. Well, anyway, I, I look more closely at the engine. Well, it's a strange thing to see a clergyman or a teacher so interested in engines. The fact is, I'm more interested in the boiler. Eh, the boiler could stand more attention than they get. On board there! Throw another arm for the wood on the fire! Aye, aye, sir. Oh, uh, what kind of wood is it? Seasoned wood, sir. It burns fast and hot. Mm -hmm. I should think it'd make a lot of difference what kind of wood it is if, if you want to control the fire. <laughs> Lord, sir, nobody can control fire under a boiler. It gives you too much steam or no steam or some steam. There's, there's no telling what. There's no one invented a way to control it. Uh, it's like making soup. Every man to his own taste. <laughs> well, now, maybe I could give that problem some thought. Yeah, are you an inventor, too? I've experimented with the properties of heat and made some improvements in stoves and so forth. Uh, wood stoves? No, coal stoves. Uh, coal would be no good for steamboats. How would you get it to burn right? Well, I I couldn't tell you at the moment, but it's something to think about. Yeah. Wood is so very unsatisfactory and so unreliable. Steam drop, Captain. All right. The step aboard, Dr. Knott. I'll give orders to start. Uh, thank you. I think so. At least I didn't have to dive in the water for safety like some of your other passengers. Ever want to count a car? Aye, aye, Captain. Got a whole hood. That's good. I tried not to let you in for this, Doctor. I, I think I understand now why the seats in the barge are more expensive. We really should find some way to prevent a similar accident. Dr. Olipple of Knott decided to combine the improvements on a domestic stove with the problem of a good steam boiler, and in 1829, filed six patents covering the application of heat to steam boilers. They brought into existence the first base burning stove to use a hard anthracite coal. In order to test the practicability of this boiler, he designed a boat 150 feet long and had it built in New York. Captain Peck was given command. And on the evening of May 18, 1831, Dr. Knopf's boat, as it was called, docked at Albany, where it was greeted by an interested crowd. Keep up! Follow it! Make fast! Follow it! Follow the gate, Frank! Well, Dr. Knott, your ball is our success. Well, I don't think they'll blow up, Captain. Yeah, right you are, sir. All right, show up. Dr. Knott. Dr. Knott, uh, may I speak to you a moment? Uh, just a moment, young man. Dr. Knott's going ashore. Uh, Dr. Knott, I represent the Albany Argus, and I'd appreciate a word or two about your new boat. Why, gladly, sir. She's a fine-looking boat, Doctor. Most unusual, in fact. She's full of new improvements. Uh, that's why I call her the novelty. I understand the boilers are your invention. And you burn anthracite coal? Yes, yes. It gives the greatest heat for the smallest fuel space. Well, how far will the coal take you? Well, many times further than the same space filled with wood. That's very interesting, sir. I I think I'm safe to predict that within 12 months, ships equipped with anthracite boilers, like those, will be crossing the Atlantic. May I quote you on that, sir? Certainly, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Knott. You've done something big for navigation. Uh, one more question. How long did it take you to make this trip? Well, we left New York at 9 this morning. 13 hours? Well, that's a record. 
Just think, all that power coming from anthracite coal. Give some credit, my friend, to man's inventive mind and the guidance of divine providence. Three men of Dickens, each endowed with a spirit of experiment, imagination, and service to mankind, did the pioneer work that developed steam navigation. All honor to these men who add their inspiration to the power of progress in the cavalcade of America. The early steamboats are just memories today, phantom ships of the past brought to life for these few fleeting minutes in the cavalcade of America. Today, as we read the daily papers, go to the newsreels, or scan the travel folders, our minds are centered on such noble ships as the Queen Mary, the Normandy, and other floating palaces. John Fitch's first steamboat could be tucked into that part of the smokestack of the Normandy that rises above the top deck with plenty of room to spare. But modern progress in shipbuilding is more than a matter of size alone. It has to do with every kind of material and equipment. DuPont's chemical research has contributed much to this progress, and one good example is found in Dulux marine finishes. If you've ever seen discarded ships anchored in some backwater, deserted and uncared for, rusting and rotting away under the attacks of water and weather, you will appreciate the importance of the finish used to protect the hull superstructure. That's why sailors are always busy with paint brushes. For years, DuPont chemists carried on tests to find the base for a finishing material that would be superior to anything in the world for endurance and appearance, especially for protection against the vicious attacks of such destroyers as salt spray, salt air, and harbor gases. Finally, after countless experiments, they found such a base, and various finishes made from it are called Dulux. Another feature of Dulux marine finishes is the ease with which they can be cleaned and washed. You may well imagine that the constant scrubbing and hosing down received by ships in order to keep them trim and ship shape is a wearing process. Not only does Dulux stand up under this wear, but its remarkable glossy smoothness makes cleaning much easier. Wherever Dulux is used, it protects against deterioration. In the home, it retains its clean, white beauty on refrigerators despite humidity, grease, and abrasion. On steel structures, it retards rust and corrosion. On other surfaces, it would stand changing temperatures, excessive moisture, dust, and grime. It is used in hundreds of ways on thousands of articles. This DuPont chemical achievement is just one more illustration of the way DuPont makes good its pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. American journalism will be the title of the broadcast when next week, at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W-A-B-C, New York.